right, so some people has already come, some survived. It's five o'clock and the last talk starts. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan Nikolaev and uh, I'm a gameplay developer at uh, Wargaming, part of the World of Tanks team. Uh, in this talk, I will share with you some of the experience in uh, developing a uh, UI framework for a AAA game. And uh, I will also like, just show you briefly what World of Tanks looks like from a developer's perspective. So for those who like never seen it, are there any here? All right, you, at least one. So I have like at, at least three slides for you. Um, well, World of Tanks um, basically is a multiplayer online action game in which players fight each other using like this mid-20 steer uh, armored vehicles. And uh, it features like a complex meta game when you have players progression, you have like all this uh, I don't know, player interactions, players can join clans together. They can uh, customize their vehicles, uh, buy stuff, uh, research new ones, and uh, unlock modules, complete quests. So there's really a lot of stuff happening at once uh, in this game. And uh, it's a like, very long living project. It's around for almost 10 years, like the 2019 is the 10th year since the early alpha. And a lot of stuff really happens uh, during the year because we release these features which, um, for example, like the New Year one, where you can customize your hunger, you can decorate your uh, Christmas tree, apply all sorts of customizations to the vehicle. Uh, recently, during the summer, we released the Steel Hunter event, which basically is a battle royal tank fashion and so on. So there's a lot of things to do, and from the developer's perspective, it's a lot of code base you have to keep alive, to keep maintainable, do changes actually, don't break, don't explode, and so on. So how it looked back in the days, it's like 10 years ago almost, it was very simple, it was perfect. <laughs> I mean, there are like few game modes, very simplistic interfaces, and everyone was happy. Through the years, it kind of evolved a bit, so this is how it looks nowadays. I mean, a lot of uh, stuff which, is, which people are expecting from a AAA game. Actually, that's me playing, and I'm kind of really bad at this game, so it took a while to take this screenshot. But uh, by the way, uh, you have like, a lot of stuff happening at the screen at once. You have these transparencies, animations, people exploding, actually tanks exploding, and uh, all sorts of stuff you'd expect from a game like this and to please the eye. Uh, this is like the game battle UI, but so there is like also the hunger, and do, this is the place where all of sort of meta game happens. So here you have your like, uh, sorry, it's like the tanks roster. You have your vehicle characteristics, the crew. Uh, you have all these panels, buttons, a lot of stuff happening at once. And if you are not scared by this, it can become something like this when you have like windows overlapping with each other, tooltips with animations, uh, your, I don't know, teams uh, which you write you in the chat, you can have your notifications there. So a lot of markers, bullets, all happening at once. So developing stuff like this uh, can be really complex and from the developer's perspective, all this stuff looks basically like this. I mean, we have three big components which are responsible for driving the stuff you have seen before. And the big one, which I'm not covering in much detail here actually at all, is the big world engine. And uh, it does all the rendering simulation stuff. It uh, performs uh, like all the physics simulations if you need, the resource lookup from the disk and so on. Uh, there's also the hardware abstraction layer, the network which communicates with the game server and going on. Then we have like the scale form SDK. Uh, for those who are not familiar with, it's kind of de facto standard for writing game UIs back in the days. But uh, basically, it's a flash player with an action script runtime, which you can use to write your like animated buttons and all your transitions, highlightings, and so on. And obviously, we have Python. Otherwise, I won't be on this conference. And the point is that Python logic is uh, 
the one which uh, drives everything else. So you can think about Big World Engine as a set of low-level tools, like display models, render stuff, play sounds, and so on. But what exactly makes a game actually a game is the Python scripts which decide what is to be rendered, uh, what is going to be like uh, the reaction on some given event, for example, when your vehicle explodes or when you need repairments and so on. So a lot of Python actually, a lot of stuff happening there. And just to uh, focus a bit on the UI side, let's see how developing, for example, a visual component using Python and scale form looked back in the days. Uh, this is the ammunition panel. So you have this component in the hunger here. And it's like an, an entry point where the user enters to do some pretty quick operations, like setting up the vehicle for the battle and uh, like choosing the shells which are going to be charged into the gun. Uh, applying any boosters if you have any, using your equipment, um, installing modules if you need, or like go into more detail to the setup windows like the service one, which opens all sort of uh, replacement options, and the exterior, which allows you to paint all these pretty nice textures on top of your vehicle. But from the terms uh, of a Python developer, basically uh, you end up in uh, a hierarchy like this. So basically, the Flash developer marks up all the UI, writes down all the layout code, and performs, uh, I don't know, like writes all the code which is responsible for highlighting stuff in green based on some conditions and so on. And the UI code basically is all about uh, what you would normally expect when you write, I don't know, a web application. So you have your labels, you have your buttons, your reactive events, and so on. But at some point, they have to communicate. And how it happened before is that you have these um, meta classes. Don't confuse them with uh, Python meta classes. They, they can just be interpreted as a basic abstract interfaces. And you have like uh, this bridge, which is auto-generated, uh, where from one point, when some user interaction happens on the front end, uh, these two methods are triggered. For example, the player button presses like the uh, ex do you see anything like the exterior uh, button? And at Python, we will have this show customization uh, method triggered. And if Python, for example, decides that the vehicle just came out of the battle all destroyed and needs repairments, it has to send that message for the label here, like that it's not ready for battle in some way. So that's usually like by calling this uh, AS underscore, like update data, set data, update vehicle stuff, and so on. So. What are like the actual lines of code you're going to write? Uh, basically, your class actually stripped it a bit of the code, but anyway, it looks something like this. You have this ammunition panel class, which derives from the meta. You subscribe during the initialization phase here on some global events, like for the vehicle ones, like for uh, money changes and so on. Uh, you, for example, implement the actual methods for doing something when the player clicks on uh, the interface. Uh, so global event being fired on the global bus, which opens another window and turn and so on. But the real uh, meet happens here. We have this update method, which usually reacts to all sorts of events, like, I don't know, the vehicle came out of the battle or it's like destroyed, it gets sold or something like that. So you, for example, pickle it, yeah, global variables, and uh, start to update all the pieces of the interface imperatively. So you tell the flash that, hey guys, I need here my counters on the boosters, on the customization, new entries, and so on. And you have like these huge dicts. Actually, the device's stuff is really big, and there's a lot of stuff happening there. So you populate it imperatively. What are the problems with this approach? There are quite kind of few. Uh, first, you have a tight coupling between your interface uh, because it's dictated that you have to derive from that base classes between Python and Action Script. And obviously, if this is brittle, if you have to change one single button, you basically have to call the Action Script guy and tell, "Hey, dude, I changed that one. Uh, please update your code accordingly. Otherwise, the client won't even start." And a lot of sorts of problems like that. Then you have. Uh, this freeform exchange, as I shown previously for the devices, and 
like dicts have all the problems of the world, like you can mis mistype a key, you can just miss a value, you can have like a typo in, in the key name or something like that. And it's a thing which is not stated anywhere, so every developer is free to put inside whatever he wants, and if you are lucky, your code will work. Basically, uh, because you trigger for all the changes to these calls of methods, uh, you will have redundant draw calls because uh, when you, for example, need to update the counter of the shells you are going to mount on your vehicle, and if that's just one single shell can change it, you have to re redraw all the panel, for example. When you have a highly dynamic battle UI, this can have huge performance penalties because for s even small updates of each component, you are basically redrawing all the interface at once. Actually, I don't know how many of you can write action script nowadays, but probably not a few will admit it. But anyway, uh, it's hard to find developers which can write this code. And the technology is a bit out of date. You have um, these, like the Flash uh, tools, the, I don't know, the compilers, uh, the editor is kind of an expensive tool. Uh, Ah, yeah, I forgot to say it about the state. When you have these components which share everyone like his own version of the truth of what is like the highlighted button or what is the counter, uh, there is no master data. So Python thinks that so the number of shells is like 10 and we got lost something in the events and then the UI is not up updated accordingly. If you have to reproduce a bug, you will have to reproduce the exact chain of events needed to obtain that very state. So we tried to do, yeah, Scaleform is dead, so that's another, uh, another talk, but anyway. So we tried to do something with this. Uh, basically, our first attempt was integrating a full-fledged web browser into our client. So, I mean, uh, you can write web applications. So they look very like uh, native client applications, but it's just because you apply to the right styles in CSS to your div classes. And the point is that it turned out to be a good solution for big projects like the web shop because you can integrate it. It works most of the time alone, but uh, the point is that uh, when you are coming to communicate with the native code, uh, it starts to get increasingly difficult. So, there are for certainly advantages like make UI using uh, your normal web tech and don't action script and flash, so that's kind of cool. It's open source, so you are not tied to the fate of Adobe being like a successful company for the years. And uh, you can use all the React, UGS, and so on, frameworks on top of it. But developers hiring starts to get cool. You have everyone pretty knowing at least a bit of uh, JavaScript and HTML. So that starts to get pretty cool. Well, integrating it, it's kind of complex because browser runs in a separate process, so it's a tech you don't control much. You have this uh, IPC messaging exchange between your game and the browser. Uh, the browser actually renders into a separate texture that you have in some way to map to your custom controls and it does not quite work a bit well for the speed. Uh, also, since it's a browser and with its own JavaScript runtime, you have uh, very limited means to, to call code for it. So basically there are just two functions exposed and you call and build a communication protocol on top of it. The limited use case applies for something like the shop application I've shown before, but if you want to make a custom tooltip just in HTML and showing something, it will be just too, too much overhead. So yeah, I mentioned the performance problems, and we tried once again, and we got our Unbound framework. It was actually developed by the St. Petersburg team of Wargaming, and the point is that uh, it's still rendered off top of scale form, so kind of same problems with uh, tooling and so on, but it has a custom language. So, yeah, when you're in panic, develop your own language. It's obviously a good choice. You have to, what happened here? Yeah. You have to at least apply some goodies on top of it to sell to it to anyone, so it had a really good performance because it used our existing tech. Um, and obviously, it's still action script at some point translated, but anyway. Tried hiring somebody, talking to him, right? Hey, dude, we have this custom language and during the interview process, and you are going to learn it, and you are going to use all those scarce tools we developed for it. And obviously, the interview won't go that well. So it was a dead end for us. But we liked the approach in which 
uh, people developed interfaces using JavaScript, uh, using the HTML. So we found out that game face framework worked kind of well for us. For instance, it's still based on browser tech. I mean, um, game face is, is basically a, a stripped down browser which supports a limited subset of HTML and DOM. Uh, so the document object model. And it allows you to use the bare minimum of functionality the web application can have. Uh, so you can use your like frameworks and so on. It has a very flexible SDK in terms that uh, you have granularity upon interacting with the virtual machine so you can send data back and forth and build some robust framework on top of it. Uh, unfortunately, it does not support DirectX 9, so it's mostly related to modern machines and its proprietary. So we had to do something like this. There are like open frameworks which have some penalties on performance and the flexibility. There are like good game targeted frameworks. And by the end of the day, we end in something like this. So it's kind of a bit more difficult to learn than the previous diagram. We have like a browser here. We have like game face framework here, unbound and so on. Like weren't we supposed to make things simpler? Apparently, no, but there is like one key component here. And that's what I'm going to talk about. This is the WOLF framework. So it's an acronym, and everybody likes acronyms. And it stands like for World of Tanks UI Lightweight Framework. I spelled it here. Uh, just understand how it works internally. Uh, let's see um, the pattern which it, it is based upon, which is the MVVM pattern, at least uh, our adaptation of that pattern. The problem is that uh, for the pure MVVM in which you have like the model, the view model, and the view, uh, it turned out to be less flexible what we needed because we had this huge code base which had still to work that, uh, I mean, nobody's going to rewrite nine years of code base, so it had to work pretty well with what we had at the time. Uh, so I just will explain for those of you who have probably never seen it. Uh, it kind of works well in the Windows presentation framework, but I mean, not many probably Windows developers here. And just quickly going over it, so the view is just pure UI. It's pretty all about the layout, the markup, the visual part, and the only scripting you have is just for transitions, for animation, and so on. Uh, you have the view model, which in our case, it's uh, just a typed container. So it's uh, some kind of plain data structure which has strongly typing and provides the data binding me mechanism, which basically, uh, for those who are familiar with, I don't know, reactive programming, allows you to be notified when your data changes and allows you to uh, subscribe to events. Uh, we call them comments, but basically they are very similar to Qt's framework signals. Uh, then we have the presenter, which is basically the dude which maps all this stuff to your application which has no nothing to do to uh, deal with the rest of the application because uh, model here is our core like inventory of the player our network layer um, whatever it could be like the state of the vehicle what is actually installed on the vehicle and so on uh, so basically the model is the application and the presenter is the code which maps model data to view model data so fits it back in a format which is acceptable for the view and responds to view events like somebody press the button we go down the chain and the presenter actually issues uh, I don't know and a request to the server so it can go forward all right so with this in mind let's switch back to our wolf framework uh, this diagram was made complex on purpose to impress you, but actually uh, the core stuff is here. So we have this, um, these components which are basically uh, the implementation of the MVVM framework, so uh, the data binding mechanism, uh, the windowing model and so on. And it allows us to integrate whatever UI framework you would like by implementing like these private interfaces. So to not be bound, as in the case with the scale form, to some specific implementation of the UI frameworks. And uh, on the left side, we have the presentation layer, which is the abstraction which allows you like to deal with uh, the views without knowing what kind of view it actually is. And here is uh, our domain of interest because we have like this Python framework which allows us to write code. Uh, one important component in all this stuff is uh, our custom generation. 
code generation, which is a set of tools which provides us with the means to generate boilerplate and so on. Uh, so just to, I mean, to, to exemplify a bit of the whole stuff, uh, let's try to look at this component once more. Uh, basically, suppose the, I don't know, the designer guy comes and tells, hey, we all need to implement like this view, uh, where the player will be able to purchase um, the decals of the paints he wants to apply on top of his vehicle. So it has to support uh, a list of items to be shown. Uh, what kind of season they are, because in World of Tanks you have all these different maps which are themed uh, in three different seasons, let's call them that way, like summer, winter and desert. So for your tank to look nicely in that uh, environment, you just apply the right paint. Um, the point here is uh, we want also to provide the user a choice about what is going to be actually bought when you click like select and select stuff. And we don't want the UI code to sum all the gold coins and show them up, but you want that to be part of your business logic since those like expressions are something related to your domain logic, which is not related to the UI. And uh, obviously, we want to allow the user to buy stuff. So on press on purchase and exit, you are going out and committing the transaction to the server. Uh, how it looks like? Uh, in development process. So the first thing in new model you're going to do is to define the view model. So actually we're going to do that in YAML. Why YAML? Because the point is uh, we don't want to write boiler code by, by hand. We want to automatize this as, as much as possible and uh, we made this choice in which you declare your view model which remember is just a plain data structure in this hierarchy uh, which allows you to, I don't know, in the case of our window, we have one row property which is like, is there enough money? Just to highlight the button on and off. And the check for whether there is enough money in the, val in the wallet is done by the business logic, obviously. Uh, we have like two sub-models here. And one is the seasons, so the actual three tiers of uh, stuff to buy is this sub-model and the price. Since we have like few uh, currencies, it's not just a plain integer, but a bit more complex. And we have two commands, obviously. One, we have to react when the user selects or deselects any elements, and the other one is when you, he actually commits a transaction. Am I going too fast? Is it okay? Okay. Um, so, uh, how looks the sub-model for one season? It's just the name of the season, count of entries, and the actual entries, which is the plain array. Uh, array of the model, I mean, it's, it another, it's another sub-model, which in this uh, in the case is the sub-model of a given card slot. So the actual paint or style or decal or something like that. And at its own time, it's very simplistic. So our like paint has an ID, it has the state whether it's selected or not. Uh, it has an icon or a quantity and so on. And the same price I mentioned before. So we threw this stuff into the code generator who spits out uh, a number of artifacts. One is the actual auto-generated view model uh, class. Uh, here is a lot of magic happening. No, actually, it's very simple because the view model in the end is not um, a strongly typed class, but it's just uh, a list of accessors which just look into a plain array. It was mine. Yeah, uh, just into a plain array uh, in the underlying C++ level, where you have just a simple array of variants. That's to keep all things together fit in the, into memory and for optim optimization reasons. So each time you call the total price, you just get a view model from the index one and spit it out. When you like look for the money property, you take the Boolean variant at the ninth index. Same thing for other properties and models. And the only thing that changes is like the signals which are created using this API. So we have like here a declarative like Python class which works in the underlying imperative-like layer. Uh, I will show the advantages of this in a minute. Uh, the other part of code which is generated is this TypeScript one. So it exactly mirrors pretty much all of the stuff we have seen before, uh, because uh, the guys which are writing the uh, game face application, they use uh, TypeScript and use React.js. 
So basically, they want some type of interface to write correctly their code. And we have, like for the cart model, the, same, the very same properties, which just mirror what we have seen just a second ago. Uh, so in the end, what do we have to write by hand? I mean, uh, we have the view model, and we are going to fill it in, in some way. And basically, all the code people usually have to write is uh, the actual presenter part. Remember, we have the view, which is written by, I don't know, in this case, like the web guys. Uh, we have the model, which is already there, so the um, core tanks application. Uh, the view model is generated for, uh, automatically by, by the um, tool generator, the code generator. And the only missing piece here is the presenter. Um, the view model actually supports transactions. Uh, remember the problem with uh, the update granularity where you have like uh, some t tiny update which triggers a big update on the UI. Um, since uh, all the properties this time are reactive, they notify the user interface when they change, doing a lot of changes in, in a series can trigger also to performance problems. So we applied like a database concept here. You can lock your model, create a transaction for it, update all the submodels, like the price here, uh, set the counter of given seasons, uh, create and populate and so on, and unlock the model. When the context manager goes out of the scope, it will like send all the changes in a batch and you will have like uh, an efficient update of only what is needed. Uh, it fits pretty well in uh, what people do when writing React.js application, when you have like your Redux state, uh, which just propagates the only necessary changes and you have only the minimum DOB updates you need. And actually, it plays re really nice with the, with the web stuff. Um, so for the events, which for example are the select and the select, uh, we have these two methods. Remember, the selection one, we just gets an index. So this is an event called from the UI when the user like clicks on the selection tick. And the buy button I mentioned before. Same thing here, like we lock the model, update a couple of fields, and unlock it. Um, we have like very simplistic buy method. It just checks whether the player has enough money to perform the purchase and destroys the window. So applies the transaction and destroys the window. So, uh, by the end of the day, what do we have right now? Um, well, the V model is the data exchange protocol. So you don't have these interfaces which uh, define the methods to be called and which translate into a direct function call. You have this data structure which lives on its own and it has a very efficient representation on the underlying level where you have like this, remember, array of variants. It can be dumped at any w time, so debugging this stuff is much easier or even like reproducing, uh, I don't know, bugs just by uh, populating the memory with an existing model for the existing view. Um, since uh, you have property level granularity, you can optimize the draw calls uh, as, as you wish. Uh, I mean, you can submit them one by one if just an element changed or like in a batch when a lot of uh, items changed. Uh, then you have uh, this um, UI agnostic framework. So. Uh, coming back to that customization cart window, uh, it turned out that at, at the time when we released it, DirectX 9 was still a plenty of uh, player base of our game, so we couldn't just tell, okay, these guys couldn't buy any more like, customization stuff. And by uh, how the framework is organized, you can uh, even swap the view part at runtime because you have the view model, which is basically does not know anything about neither the presentation, neither the, the view part. Uh, so by staying oriented this way, uh, at runtime time when the game starts, it does some checks on the hardware, sees like, okay, for this guy, I cannot use uh, game face, so I'm using like the scale form backend, and the Python developer has to do nothing, basically, to support this change. Um, also, uh, this flexibility allows you to work independently, so you can develop your code without uh, taking each time on the shoulder the front-end guy and telling him, hey, dude, please change that part of code. Uh, you're just basically writing your own Python code, looking just at, at the YAML definition of what is the view model. So you don't do any uh, interoperability questions and remarks in terms of, of writing code down. Uh, 
yeah, since you have like three frameworks actually integrated, you can write the code in whatever language you want, whatever tools you need. And this, for example, game phase dies today. Uh, we can still like some backup options because we, the only part of code we need to change through the years is the presentation one. Or, for example, as uh, you can check uh, Dmitry Karpov's uh, talk about porting Python code, nobody of the view uh, development team of the front-end development team has to do to nothing about that because all the presenter code that we write in Python, it's our burden and we have to take it over. One definitely clear benefit of having uh, this view model oriented approach is that you have your code easily testable. You can write your automated testing without having even an instance of client running because you don't need the renderer part. So the only thing you need is your model definition and you can test the presenter by just running your unit test and expecting that the model is populated in the way you expect with the data you expect. And that's pretty it. I mean, for the faster prototyping stuff, uh, I, I don't know even if it's worth mentioning because you just uh, have this uncoupled code which is de developed independently. And I mean, it makes things much, much faster. So for those of you who are still alive, I have like just a few takeaway tips. I mean, the first one is obviously state data oriented. Uh, changing data structure is much easier. It's less costly than changing interfaces, wrappers, and bindings. Uh, when you have like bindings which are uh, written, even using like uh, code generation tools like Sweek or PyBind and so on, you are still writing a lot of stuff which mirrors your existing code. When you have these data containers exchange it around, the only thing you write is the transport mechanism when you have like these variants which have to talk to your UI backend, but nothing more is gonna be written because uh, it, uh, I mean, the JavaScript for instance in game phase run in its own world, and the only thing it needs to know about is how your underlying, underlying data changes and not how your API changes. And yeah, for like for the code, which is still gonna to be written down for like for the view model, we have the TypeScript definitions and we have like the Python classes. You still have to write some code and please don't write it by hand. Optimize as much as possible and use code generation tools. So they're not difficult to write, especially if you consider like uh, all the web stuff is actually code generation back in the days like PHP and so on. You can write it in whatever technology you want. Uh, yeah, keep the state flat, please. Uh, I mean, uh, when you have this tightly packaged data container, you can serialize it. Think just for a moment when you have, I don't know, crash reporting tool, you, the players are playing your game and suddenly they got an exception. Okay, ho what happens? Usually you try to achieve, the, uh, obtain the logs, try to look at the, the stuff and see what happened in what progression to lead you to that exactly game state. But here you can just write, you know, a big try except and the root of your program. And if anything happens, you just take all the view models you have in memory, dump them to a JSON format, I don't know, to whatever you want, and send it over a wire, and the developers could be able to reproduce the exact state of the application that the player had without any additional, I don't know, body movements. So, uh, yeah, the lesson we learned hard Please do not make assumptions on the tech lifetime because tech comes and goes. I mean, nowadays, like React.js and all that stuff is the de facto for making new interfaces and so on. But that may not be the case for the future coming. And if you stay like data oriented, you know that the data, the raw data is the universal language of talk. And it's hard that, I don't know, floats, booleans and strings are going to be deprecated tomorrow. And the only thing which is constant is in this world is change, so please design for change. That's pretty it. I eat like five minutes more, but thanks and questions. Hello, Juan. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so basically my question is, uh, in the previous implementation, the first implementation you had uh, like bending, imperative bending for uh, both UI and for game loop stuff. Yeah. Ga yeah. So uh, in the latest implementation, you had 
data binding for UI stuff, but what about game loop stuff for about game logic, basically? Uh, the update function I mentioned in the first slides are not game loop, are just update functions which are called related to a series of events first. And um, this part is, um, I mean, the whole framework is not related to the actual, uh, how I can tell, uh, like the meta game mechanics, they remain low level. So this is the presentation to the user interface, what, ho what happens inside the game. So you don't use this approach to write your actual game mechanics code. Yes, uh, and what about UI that is exactly not in the shop, but in the game itself? So is it uh, written on the same UI framework or it is done on, on no, actually, on game framework? Yeah, actually that UI is our old legacy, so we didn't port all the stuff to it. Uh, this framework, as we designed it, so that's why of the, the need of the presentation layer, because we had to live with an existing uh, code base and we couldn't like afford to, to rewrite it to the new stuff. So uh, just how it happens, I, I will try to slide a bit. It will be kind of slow. Yeah, here, unbound or beat, like game face is just on the core implementers of this new approach. But uh, what happened before, it stays still like uh, somewhere here, call it that way. So we don't have the means to port the old views to new ones in terms of feasibility. So they just render into textures which integrate uh, into our main mechanism, and this is abstracted by, by this layer here. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, what is better, World of Tanks or World Thunder? Uh, I think I will be a bit biased to answer. But definitely, I'm playing in my own game. Kind of badly, okay. but it's nice. And um, uh, what uh, you, I heard you don't have a garbage collector in Python, and uh, what you use as interpreter? You uh, that's kind of a bit of misleading information. There is a garbage collector, it's disabled. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is like still reference countings. When you have, for example, your objects uh, with reference count zero, they go out of scope, obviously, and they are got collected. Uh, we run the garbage collector at times that we can to do that. For example, you got out of your battle, there's like the hunger loading, and at that point, I mean, a small freeze in, t in the interaction with the user is acceptable, so we just run the garbage collector, for example, in that moment. It, uh is, a, is that happens that situation that uh, in collector it's uh, is it data that you can't handle can't handle it's uh, or you have to run garbage collector I'll try try mm. a bit different I, I, I it's not following me well uh, I, I can elaborate a bit on that. I mean, the point is that you have to pay attention to write code which is collectible just by reference counting. Because since the garbage collector like could not even run for, for some periods, uh, you have to ensure that, for example, self doesn't reference a dict which stores a reference to a self method. Because that will be like a cyclic depend dependency and it won't be collected. But we have like these profiling tools which allows us to, I don't know, like display this object out and try to optimize them out. Other questions? I'm pretty sure there should be at least one more. No? Okay. Thank you.